Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ganesh Srinivasan. I'm a program manager in the Windows Azure networking team. And I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all about some of the new features that we've introduced as part of the release that we made two weeks back. So it's been an exciting release because we've released, uh, you know, it's pretty much like a re-release of Windows Azure for us because we've introduced a whole bunch of new features and uh, we've done a lot of works under the covers to essentially enable all these cool new features. So overall, it, it has been a, you know, a giant step for us from a networking perspective. So I'm going to be talking about quite a few things. So there are essentially two sessions where I'll be covering networking topics in detail. The first session is to give you an overview of all the investments we've made uh, in networking at a high level, and I'll have another session tomorrow evening where I'll cover what we've made to enable hybrid scenarios possible. So we've enabled virtual networks and site-to-site -site connectivity. That's going to be covered in a separate talk tomorrow. But let's look at what I'm going to be talking about today. So as you all know, we've made a lot of investments in Azure to enable infrastructure as a service, which means you can run your own virtual machines in Windows Azure. Now, that was not a simple task for us. Everything in Azure was optimized for PaaS, so we, we really had to rethink everything right from the physical network we had in our data centers. So I'll talk about how we basically redesigned the networks in our data centers to essentially support infrastructure as a service. I'll then talk about some of the concepts that we've had around in PaaS for a while in terms of connectivity and networking. And we'll then jump into talking about all the new features we've introduced. And the new features that we've introduced enables us to support a, a whole bunch of uh, customer scenarios that you can actually use. So I'll talk about them in the context of the scenarios. I then have Philip from Exit Games, who's actually going to show you a cool demo of his multiplayer online game system. And he's built it based on the new features that we've released as part of this release that we made two weeks back. So it's going to be exciting to see how uh, Philip and team have put together all the cool features that we've released and built a gaming system in Azure. It's really exciting. So with that, I, uh, before I get started, I wanted to know how many of you have uh, attended Scott Guthrie's and uh, Mark Rasanovich's talks yesterday on Windows Azure? Cool. It makes my life easy. And how many of you attended Corey Sanders' talk just before this? OK, good. And uh, how many of you have used Windows Azure in the past when it was a past platform? OK, that's great. So now let's get into the topic for today. So as you all know, Windows Azure has historically been a platform as a service provider, so which means people hosted services in Windows Azure that was you know, mostly internet services. So you'd write applications that was essentially exposed to the internet. Majority of the traffic was essentially north-south traffic, which is in and out of the data center. So in order to optimize for that, the, data, the, the physical networks in our data centers were optimized to handle north-south traffic. So we had essentially a, a layer two network in the lower half of our infrastructure and a layer three network on top. So every time a packet had to flow, it had to go right up to the top of the network and come down. We had hardware-based load balancers in our data centers uh, that essentially offered load balancing as a service. I'll talk about load balancing in detail uh, as part of all the features when I talk about it. But essentially, in the past, we've been using um, hardware load balancers in our data centers. And everything was you know, uh, one to one redundant. So if there was a failure, we always had a, a standby device th in every tier to take over and run everything. So if you look at all the investments we've made in terms of infrastructure as a service and the direction we went with that, for example, we chose to use uh, our storage service to store VHDs if you wanted to have uh, virtual machines running in Windows Azure. And we knew that people were going to deploy more services that you were going to deploy services that had multiple virtual machines that had to talk to one another. You want very low latency communication between them, and you really don't want any unpredictability in the behavior of the network. So this network design we had uh, was not really optimal to offer all those capabilities to you. So what we did was we essentially went to the drawing boards again, completely redid our network in Windows Azure. So essentially, we built new clusters, new racks in, in our data centers, and we used high-density compute SKUs for our servers. And all the servers that we have in our data centers now have uh, 10 gig hardware, at least the servers that you're using for hosting infrastructure as a service or any new services that you deploy in Azure will land in one of our new data centers with all these new hardware in them. So it's high density servers with uh, 10 gigabit ethernet connectivity right from, the top of the, uh, right from the server to the top of the rack switch and from that point on. 
we have a very over, low oversubscription ratio in our network. So it's essentially optimized for uh, east-west traffic rather than north-south traffic. And that way, you know, from the top of the rack switch to the higher layers, there's pretty much no oversubscription. So it's an extremely flat network across the entire data center. So if you had services talking to your storage account, it's extremely low latency and it's the same number of hops to talk to your storage account or to another virtual machine that's hosted in your network. Um, we also, optim as I mentioned, we optimized it for east-west traffic and we did the network from to be a layer three network right from the top of the rack switch. So that gave us the ability to offer NS to one redundancy in our network. So we, we have a highly available network. Even if one of the routers on, on, on the top or upper tier actually fails, we have N minus one other paths that share the load of that one router that failed. So we, we don't actually have any hotspots in the network, even if we have a device failure uh, higher up in the networking um, infrastructure that we have. Another thing that was really costly for us to maintain and costly to run as a service was the hardware-based load balancing solution. Uh, you know, buying 10, gig, 10 gigabit Ethernet-based load balancers was an expensive proposition, and the fact that most of the live sites that we ran into in our production data centers were related to the load balancer. So that was something that we really wanted to change. So what we did was we essentially built our own software-based, homebrewed software-based load balancing solution. And that's what powers our entire data centers today. So pretty much any service that you have hosted in Azure today runs in our software-based load balancing solution. It's a highly scalable uh, software-based load balancing solution that we've built. It's also an Azure tenant that sits in the same cluster and offers load balancing as a service. So it all happens under the covers without even you having to do anything special to take advantage of the benefits. So this can scale on demand and shrink on demand based on the load for the, uh, that we have on the data centers. and. Uh, it also you know, enables us to add new features that we want at a rapid pace. So if we wanted to add a new feature that was missing, so for example, in the previous session, some of you asked about our plans to support layer seven load balancing or IPv6 support. Having a software-based load balancer enables us to add support for those things in a, in a very fast manner. It just helps us iterate really fast and develop it. So this has been helpful in actually enabling us to provide some of the new features that we've uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. So just to give you a, a comparison of how the network looked and how it looks right now, as you can see, it's undergone a, a major change for us. We've had to roll out this in pretty much every region, and we've managed to do that in a pretty short amount of time. So let's now talk about some of the basic concepts that we've had in Azure, uh, and uh, then talk about some of the new features that we're releasing. So first of all, in Azure, we have the concept of cloud services. You've, you would have uh, known it as hosted services in the past. And for every hosted service or cloud service, we actually offer a virtual IP, a public IP address um, for each deployment slot. So we have two deployment slots that we offer for a service, a staging slot and a production slot. And for every slot, we actually assign a public IP address. And that's the only IP address we assign for the entire service. If you have multiple tiers or multiple virtual machines deployed, they will all be mapped to a single public IP address that we assign for that service today. And I wanted to make one more note here. Pretty much all the investments we've made in networking today are, apply equally to infrastructure as a service and uh, platform as a service. And uh, I'm going to be trying to focus primarily on infrastructure as a service. And Philip, when he does his demo, has predominantly used platform as a service. So you get to see the same set of features pretty much used in, in both contexts, so you get a good feel of how uh, the same set of features can be used in both infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. So as I mentioned earlier, we just have one public IP address that's assigned per deployment slot, and you have to define what is called as an input endpoint, which is essentially a protocol and a port that you open up. You specify TCP or HTTP or HTTPS and a port if you're using TCP to open up connect connectivity, and we have essentially a firewall based solution that we run in our hypervisor VM switch that offers isolation. So by default, when you define or create a virtual machine or you create a, a pass instance, the firewall is closed. No ports are open by default, and you'll have to define these endpoints to open up connectivity to allow traffic to go back and forth. In the case of infrastructure as a service, we take care of the firewall and the hypervisor layer, and we leave configuring the virtual machine's firewall to you. But if you're using platform as a service, web or a worker role, we actually have a guest agent 
running in the virtual machine that actually programs the firewall of your virtual machine. And to get back to input endpoints, so it's actually a single port. It, it could be TCP, let's say TCP port 500 that you choose to open up to the internet. So you could actually open it up and you know, load balance across multiple instances. So by default, an input endpoint is actually a load balance endpoint that you define for your service. So the set of protocols that we supported till SDK 1.6, which was the release that we made early this year, was HTTP, HTTPS, and TCP. Okay? So this takes care of connectivity in and out from the internet, but it doesn't help you with connectivity between various role instances or various virtual machines that you have deployed within your single service. So for that, what we have is an internal endpoint. So you'll have to define an internal endpoint, and an internal endpoint could be a single port or a port range that you actually open up to enable inter-instance communication. So if you had one VM wanting to talk to another VM that's part of the same service, you would actually define an internal endpoint to open up a particular port or a port range. And the only protocol that we supported for internal communication was TCP. And uh, there's another thing that we did, as I mentioned earlier, we have the hypervisor, uh, we have a filtering platform in our hypervisor switch that does all the isolation and ackling. And by default, your trust boundary is that of a single deployment. So if you had a cloud service or a hosted service and you had a staging and a production deployment slot, all the VMs within a single deployment slot can, can only talk to one another. And if you actually wanted to talk to something else that's hosted in another service, you would have to go through the public internet to connect to the other services. That's the trust boundary we had. And also, you wanted some sort of way to resolve and communicate with other instances. So at a service level, if you hosted a service, we give you a VIP. We actually map the VIP to a, a, an A record, and it's usually your service name dot cloud app dot net. That's the default suffix that we give you, and that's the default DNS name that we register in our uh, Azure DNS resolvers, and that we map it to your, the VIP of your production slot. So that was the name resolution we had. And if you had multiple instances within your service and they had to communicate with one another, we had what was called as our fabric runtime APIs. You had to use APIs to essentially resolve VMs and you know, talk to one another. It required you to write code to actually enumerate other instances, get their IPs, and talk to one another. Now, as you can see, these feature sets is what we had with SDK 1.6, and they're not really suitable to running infrastructure as a service or virtual machines in Azure, and they constrain you to only run a select set of scenarios that, is, that, that were possible in Windows Azure. Now, we wanted to open up uh, Azure as a platform for running a whole bunch of other scenarios, so uh, we did quite a few investments to add on to the feature set we, that we have here. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of scenarios uh, going forward, and closer to the end of that, I'm going to have Philip come over and actually show you a demo of how quite a few of these features tied together. So let's start with gaming and media streaming. Now, one of the constant complaints we've had with, from Philip and other people like Philip is the fact that there is no UDP support in Windows Azure. So gaming, media streaming, and all these kinds of services were not really possible to be hosted in Windows Azure. That was a big disadvantage for that. And you know, it's, it was not just the fact that we, we wanted to support UDP. We wanted to support UDP from the internet through the load balancer. Supporting UDP through a load balancer is not a very simple task because if it was TCP, we had something to go based on the state, the state of the flow. But in the case of UDP, it's on a per packet basis, so we had to do quite a bit of work in our load balancer to actually maintain state and maintain consistency in the way we routed packets to the backend servers that we had. Um, in addition to you know, UDP, uh, Philip also wanted the ability to connect to every role instance behind the load balancer, and he's going to show you why he's doing that, but primarily the fact that if you wanted to direct traffic to a particular instance, you wanted that ability as well. So for that, we actually enabled UDP for virtual machines. We allow UDP both uh, coming into the network through the load balancer as well as UDP for communication between virtual machines. So I'm going to show you a demo, but in the, if, you, if you are using platform as a service in the past and you're used to looking at the service definition schema, it's extremely simple to enable UDP right now. All you have to do is replace wherever you had TCP with the word UDP, and you have uh, UDP communication enabled for that. Now, just to showcase how UDP works, what I've done is I've actually set up a media streaming server in Windows Azure. So I actually created a virtual machine, configured it to be a media streaming server, and I've opened up 
uh, the right kind of endpoints to enable that. So let me actually go to the portal and show you how that, that can be done. So this is the new Windows Azure portal. I'm sure you've seen it over the past few weeks here, or at least today you would have had it, or yesterday and today you've seen it in a, a whole bunch of sessions that we've presented in. Um, just to demonstrate this, I actually created a virtual machine ahead of time. Uh, we'll TS into it. I call it the Stream VM, and I put it in a cloud service called mediastream.cloudapp.net. So when I created it, it automatically gave me a WIP, which is a 168.62, and it mapped it to this uh, a record. So I'm going to log into this. So it is just a, a vanilla virtual machine. I just deployed Windows Server 2008 R2. And I downloaded the uh, streaming media uh, pack and added it as a role to the Windows Media Server. I didn't have to do anything fancy other than that. And the streaming media server by itself is configured to operate on UDP by default. So I didn't have to go muck around with any setting in the virtual machine to enable UDP communication. So. When you look at the role in the virtual machine, you will see that uh, it automatically deployed the media streaming role, and it had a bunch of sample files uh, that it automatically placed in the virtual machine for media streaming. So now, the way you set up the server is exactly the same way you'd set up a media streaming server or any server that requires UDP connectivity in your premises. So if it requires you to open up firewall ports or in your virtual machine, it's up to you to you know configure that and get that set up. And since I use streaming media services, I didn't have to go out of my way to do anything. So by default, I have some content sitting here, and we can access one of the content. So now that we have virtual machines, the only way, as I mentioned earlier, to enable connectivity to this service is by opening it, opening up endpoints to that virtual machine. So by default, what we do is we block anything coming in, but we allow everything going out. So outbound path is always open by default. So any traffic that you send out will actually be source natted to that of the virtual IP that's assigned for your service and go out into the public internet. Whereas traffic that's coming in is blocked by default. You would have to define what is called as an endpoint to enable communication. And what the portal shows as an endpoint here is maps to the input endpoint concept that we have in virtual machines. So in this particular case, when you actually create a new virtual machine in Windows Azure using the Windows Azure portal, we by default add an input endpoint for every virtual machine. And that is to enable RDP communication to that virtual machine. So by default, you would see an endpoint that is added. Uh, the private port for that will be 3389, and the public port will be whatever it, it randomly picks a public port uh, from the TCP port range, and it maps, maps it to that. So the load balancer, in addition, in addition to opening up the port, actually does port mapping as well. So you can have a port that's publicly exposed and another set of ports that you actually want to map it to in the private range for every virtual machine. So you get to pick those two as well. And just to show you how easy it is to create an endpoint for a virtual machine, I could say add an endpoint. We'll talk about load balanced endpoints in a minute, but if I wanted to add an endpoint for a virtual machine, I could give it a simple name. Let's say I wanted to open up UDP 500. I could pick the protocol, specify the public port range that I wanted to open up, public port, and the private port. And that's it. So it's as easy as that. With a few clicks of a button, you actually have an endpoint defined and opened up for um, the virtual machine. So in order to enable media streaming as a service in, in Windows Azure, I had to open up a bunch of services. So RTSP is the standard protocol that's used for media streaming, and it uses UDP port 5000, 5004, and 5005. The way I did it was just add endpoints here. And as you can see, the service is called mediastream.cloudapp.net, and that's where the virtual machine is hosted. I'm going to open Windows Media Server. I'm going to say use RTSPU. The U stands for UDP, so I'm forcing it to use UDP for connectivity. And use mediastream.cloudapp.net. That's the site that I've hosted. And industrial.wmv is the, the file that we're going to actually stream right now. It's a sample file that Media Streaming Server places by default. So this virtual machine is actually hosted in our US East data center. And as you can see, it, you know, 
there's no problem in connecting across the continent, and uh, the server is extremely responsive and snappy. So it's extremely easy to open up UDP connectivity for virtual machines that you have in Windows Azure. The one thing that we don't support, though, or the two things that we don't support, though, is the fact that we don't support multicast and broadcast. We are in a multi-tenant infrastructure, and we're still working on how we can enable multicast and broadcast in our multi-tenant infrastructure. So just like how we enable UDP for gaming and media streaming, we had other people come to us with other demands. So for example, a lot of people wanted to run services where they wanted to monitor the health of the application. So if you're deploying pass instances, today we don't offer any way to connect to every instance behind the load balancer. You deployed a web role with 10 instances, we automatically do the magic of distributing traffic across the 10 instances, but you had no way of knowing what the health of each virtual machine was or what's happening in every virtual machine. And this was kind of a showstopper for a lot of huge applications. They wanted the ability to, A, monitor or profile the application that they have running there. And for dev test environments, they actually wanted to run a debugger. So if you're running a Java application in Azure and you wanted to actually run a debugger and you wanted to hook up to the debugger, they wanted that ability as well. So we actually enabled that with this release. So traditionally, the way the load balancer works is the fact that you have a client hit a public IP address. The load balancer terminates that, and it does a kind of a distribution view, views our own algorithms to distribute and maintain state, and it distributes the load across the N role instances that we have. But the real ask for enabling monitoring and debugging is the fact that your monitoring service or your debugging service wants direct connectivity to every instance behind the load balancer. And we've done this by introducing a new kind of an endpoint called the instance input endpoint. So what we actually do is essentially enable you to connect on a particular port behind the load balancer. And the way you'd identify each VM behind the load balancer is to actually use a port range. So in this particular case, uh, for my service, I've actually defined an instance input endpoint where I'm going to monitor the service. I'm going to mo the, the monitoring service is going to report data on port 5000. And the way I identify each instance behind the load balancer is through the port number. So if I connect to VIP colon port 1001, I get to the first instance. VIP colon port 1002, I connect to the second instance and so on. So if you actually want to have direct connectivity to every instance or route traffic to every instance, you can use uh, instance input endpoints to actually connect to and route traffic through the load balancer. Now, Philip's got a very interesting use case for this, and I'll let him talk to you about how he used this in his gaming platform to achieve better performance or better gaming experience. So let's now talk about enabling enterprise workloads in Windows Azure. Now, enterprise is where the kind of workloads that we want to support are, you know, they want serious applications to be run on Windows Azure. And the kind of connectivity options that we offered and all that did not help them much. And also the fact that since we're supporting infrastructure as a service, there are quite a few things that you know don't lend themselves well in the existing model that we had. So for example, if you wanted to have a multi-tier application hosted, so if you had, let's say, a front-end that had IIS servers, a middle-tier that had some application server, and a back-end tier that had SQL server database running, you really did not want to go and open up every port as an internal endpoint and enable communication between them. You really knew that you trusted the other VM that you're deploying in your service, and you wanted to open up all IP level com communication between the two virtual machines. The other fact is that when you're deploying multiple virtual machines, what you try to do, whether you can reach the other machine, is to ping the other virtual machine by name. So you needed two things. One, you needed name resolution to work as is without having to go through the pains of setting up DNS as a service in Azure. And the second thing you wanted was you wanted unrestricted IP level connectivity between the virtual machines that you have within a single service. It's not TCP anymore, TCP and UDP anymore. You wanted to do ICMP or any other protocol that you used on top of TCP, sorry, on top of IP. You wanted that to be supported in Windows Azure as well. So we enabled IP level connectivity between virtual machines in Windows Azure. And we also wanted to support hybrid. So we also wanted to support the ability to move applications uh, one tier at a time to Windows Azure and still maintain that level of connectivity between your premises and the cloud. And as I mentioned earlier, we've made a lot of investments to enable virtual machines running in Windows Azure. And without networking and connectivity, all those investments wouldn't have the impact that they would. So 
we had to do a lot in terms of connectivity. And for enterprise applications, the other key requirement was the fact that you always had to have high availability. And I'll talk about how you can achieve high availability using load balance sets for virtual machines. And there's something called probes that we've introduced. I talked about how we wanted IP level connectivity. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we, we are going to do for enabling hybrid connectivity today. But the meat of it will be in another session that I'll talk about tomorrow. So let's talk about custom probes. Uh, that's a new feature that we introduced. So whenever we have an input endpoint, as you all know, we are going to have a load balancer. The load balancer is going to terminate your request, and it's going to distribute traffic behind it. But let's say you had 10 instances behind the load balancer. The way we knew whether a particular instance was healthy or not was when, by the fact that the load balancer actually probed every virtual machine behind the load balancer. And in the case of web and worker roles, we actually had a guest agent running in every virtual machine that responded to the probe. And it responded to the probe saying the virtual machine is healthy or not. And oftentimes, we've had cases where the virtual machine was actually healthy, but the application running on the virtual machine was not healthy. So we actually distributed traffic to that virtual machine, even though the application running in the virtual machine was not healthy. So we had customers come to us and say, hey, hey, I don't want you to just probe the health of the application and figure out whether, sorry, probe the virtual, virtual machine and figure out whether the virtual machine was healthy or not. I want you to actually probe my application and figure out whether it's healthy or not. And I'll tell you where to probe me. So we had to enable that scenario as well for, for pass instances. And the second thing is that when you talk about virtual machines, we don't have the luxury of running a guest agent in every virtual machine. We don't have the guest agent. So one thing we could do is blast away traffic across all the instances and just hope your VM stays alive, or B, give you control over the fact that you can tell us whether your virtual machine is healthy or not, or whether it should be kept in rotation or not. So with probes, you could actually determine, let us probe you on a particular port and a protocol. And based on your response, we would know to whether we should direct traffic to you or not. So for virtual machines, it's extremely helpful to do that. And another thing that it allows you to do is kind of create your own clustering logic. So if you had n instances and you wanted to run them in active passive configuration or whatever, you could actually use probes to implement that. And you could essentially use leader election logic to essentially figure out who is going to be your leader at any given point in time, who's going to be the active virtual machine. And you can have just that instance respond to the probe request from the load balancer and have the rest of the virtual machines not respond to the probe. So we constantly probe the virtual machine. By default, the probing interval is about 15 seconds. If you don't respond for two probe requests, we know we have to take you out of rotation. In the case of pass today, we actually allow you to set the probing interval and the timeout period for probes. So you can choose your protocol, the port for probing, the interval to be probed, and uh, when to time you out. Whereas in the case of virtual machines today, we support the default probing interval, but we let you pick the probing path in the protocol. We are working on enabling support for how often to be probed for virtual machines as well. And this is extremely easy to set up. So if you're actually, I thought I had the schema, but let me get to the schema in a bit. So if you actually wanted to do this uh, for a virtual machine, you would just define an endpoint and map your endpoint to a probing protocol and a port. So if it's HTTP as a protocol, you get to specify a URL that we will probe on. And we got an HTTP 200. We, knew, we know the fact that that particular service is up and healthy, and we can route traffic to it. If it's the case where you picked TCP, if your application is actually a TCP-based application, you can specify the port, and we will try to connect to it. If the three-way handshake succeeds, we know that the application is healthy, and we immediately disconnect from that application. So you could use that to let us know that your application is healthy. So another thing that we have is the fact that in the case of PaaS, you know, the Azure is built on a PaaS platform, and our infrastructure as a service is layered on top of our PaaS platform uh, for historic reasons. And we model roles and role instances. So we actually load balance uh, between various instances that are part of the same role. So we know that the boundary for load balancing is a single role. But we, when we introduced infrastructure as a service, we had to model each virtual machine as a single instance role because each of them had its own persisted state. And let's say for high availability, you are setting up two virtual machines. Um, 
and you wanted to actually load balance between them. They are actually two different roles. So we had to tell the load balancer that these two roles actually perform a single task. So group them together as a single load balance set and distribute traffic between them. So we've enabled that support with virtual machines and you can actually set probes for that as well. So now comes the schema. So if you wanted to use probes for pass instances, what you actually have to do is create a load balancer set and then map it to a probe. You will also define a probe saying you'll specify the protocol for the probe, the probing interval, and the probing timeout uh, for the probe as well. So this is how you, you define a probe uh, for pass tenants. And for infrastructure as a service virtual machines, you will actually define it as part of your endpoint definition. You can use PowerShell to do this. Here's an example of how you do it. For your virtual machine, if you've already created a virtual machine, it's just an update operation. You'd specify the name for your endpoint. You'd specify the local and remote ports. You'd specify the protocol for probing, the path, and the port on which we want you to, uh, you want us to probe you on. So with this, you have the probe set up, and you'll know whether the application is healthy or not. And, yep. So in the current version that we have in preview right now, uh, probe is the only thing that you will have to define uh, using PowerShell, but we will integrate it into the portal in the next few drops. So in the next few weeks, you uh, see support for uh, probes being configurable through the Windows Azure portal. Just to rephrase your question, your question was, I know that if our instance is down because it didn't respond to two probes, it's taken out of rotation. When does it get added back to the rotation? So what happens is we probe continuously. The probe keeps happening continuously. We keep track of whether you responded to the probe or not. So every 15 seconds by default, and in this particular example, if we were to define our own custom probe, and I was to define a probe where my probing interval is 10 seconds, um, Every 10 seconds, the load balancer actually probes the, the instances behind the load balancer. And if you did not respond for two probes, 21 seconds, we will take you out of rotation for distributing traffic, but we will still continue to probe you. And in case your, your, the virtual machine that your service is running on is in a blade that's gone bad, or for some reasons we had to relocate your virtual machine, we will kill that instance, recreate another instance, and we will start probing that instance with the same application. So. The probing interval is fixed. We constantly probe, and the moment you start responding, we keep we add you back to the load balance set. And our load balancing is actually done in uh, layer four at this point in time. Um, layer three more than layer four at this point in time. We are trying to work on a layer seven load balancing solution that's in our roadmap, and uh, we will announce support for that pretty soon. So there are two things I mentioned earlier when I talked about enabling enterprise scenarios. One is the fact that you wanted unrestricted IP level connectivity between virtual machines. The second important thing is the fact that you don't want to change code to your SQL server or anything to resolve other instances that are part of the same service. So you, you want to just refer to the other VM by name, and you want to be able to resolve it. So what we've done is we've actually built a multi-tenant DNS service that helps you resolve virtual machines that are part of your same deployment by name. So let's say you had two virtual machines that are part of the same service. Let's say test VM1 wanted to test, uh, talk to test VM2. All it had to do was look up, uh, use our multi-tenant DNS service that's enabled by default. So when you deploy a virtual machine, we automatically register the private IP address of your virtual machine in our DNS service. and you can just look up the DNS service and resolve the other instance by name. In this particular case, if test VM, VM1 wants to talk to test VM2, it gets the IP address and it's able to communicate with test VM2. Now, it's at its very first stage right now, our internal DNS, so it offers basic name resolution as a service. And we also offer isolation. So only virtual machines that are part of the same deployment or the same service can resolve other instances and can talk to other services that are, sorry, other 
VMs that are part of the same service. So if someone else tries to connect to you, we are going to block you. And we isolate you and we make sure that no one else can discover your VM names or the IP addresses used for your virtual machines. So the basic kind of scenarios that we look to enable with this functionality is uh, the fact that you have you know, a multi-tier application all with single instances, so you can refer to each other tier by name and connect to it. Or you could even have a case where you have a bunch of web servers that are load balanced that are talking to a backend database or something where all these devices can talk to your other servers using just their host names. So there's one more thing that I wanted to mention here, which I am not going to be covering as part of this section, but I'll cover as part of uh, uh, the section where I talk about hybrid connectivity. In addition, in, in addition to providing DNS as a service for you, we also support the ability for you to bring your own DNS service, use your own DNS service to essentially do name resolution. So this comes in extremely handy when you want to run your Active Directory domain controller uh, to domain join virtual machines and do things like that. You could either use your domain controllers on-premises or use a domain controller that's running in Windows Azure or use any third-party uh, DNS service for name resolution. So you, you get to specify the DNS server IPs you want to use for your virtual machines. We give you that control. So let's, I'm going to do a demo in a minute, but before I get to that, uh, I wanted to mention one more thing. This IDNS service applies equally to both PaaS and uh, virtual machines. And in the case of PaaS, we give you the abilities to specify the VM name uh, by specifying it in the service model. So historically, when you actually uh, had a PaaS service deployed, the instance would get an RD followed by a random number as your host name for that virtual machine. It isn't very user friendly, so we decided to give you the ability to bring your own names for, for your virtual machines and your PaaS instances. So the way it works for PaaS instances is that whatever you specify as your VM name, we suffix it with the instance count. So that way, even if you're using Azure provided DNS and you want to talk to another VM down the road, you could actually refer to it by the instance name. And you'd know if you had 10 instances, uh, my VM, my web VM zero would be my first instance and so on. You could actually use names to resolve to it. The way you'd specify your own DNS server that you wanted to use for your service is using the schema here. You could specify the DNS server's IP and a name that you want to use for your DNS server. And we'd use that DNS server for name resolution. Now let's talk about some of the things that we actually showed you in the past. So I've got two virtual machines here. This is to showcase how load balancing across roles work and how probes work and how Azure provided DNS works. So I have two virtual machines that I've set up and I've set up a very simple web page uh, in both these virtual machines. It's just uh, a Windows server running uh, IIS on it. And what I've done is I have actually created a load balanced endpoint on both H, uh, HTTP and SSL. So if you look at that endpoint and you look at the endpoint's configuration, it's actually load balanced and it's load balanced between the two. Now I created this load balanced endpoint using probes. So it actually constantly uses probes to figure out whether a virtual machine is healthy or not. And let's say I was to log into one of the virtual machines and kill it, or let's say I was to stop this virtual machine altogether or restart the virtual machine, I would still be able to go to that service and connect to it using the same URL because I probe the VM and I find out that one instance is down. So by default, the second instance actually shares the load of the first instance. And this way, I can have high availability for my application. So I can have multiple virtual machines that can be your front ends, that can be load balanced, and you can actually make sure that if something is down, we don't actually direct traffic to that. So you define probe using PowerShell, and the schema was what I showed you in the uh, PowerPoint slide. And this way, even if the virtual machine is down, you shouldn't have a problem. Philip, when he comes to talk about uh, the stuff next, can actually show you how uh, he uses these probes to actually do a leader election and figure out who's the master. Uh, 
Now, there's one more thing that I wanted to show you, and that was how Azure provided DNS works. So I'm going to connect to VM1. And the easiest way to know, you know what's happening for name resolution is to use this built-in tool called NSLOOKUP. So I can run NSLOOKUP from here. So it actually, by default, contacted the Azure's DNS service. And uh, we actually have a slightly ugly suffix at this point in time that we are trying to clean up. So we actually suffix the VM with the deployment ID followed by your service name and a bunch of other stuff uh, for us to know who you exactly are and what service you belong to. So that's the ugly suffix that you see, and we're working on cleaning it up. It automatically gets me the other IP address of the other VM, so I can figure out what ProBM1 was and pro what ProBM2 was, and it automatically gives me the IP address in the private address space. So the other cool thing that we did with Azure provided DNS is the fact that I can actually log into the virtual machine. I can change the host name of the virtual machine. I can go to computer properties. I'm just going to say probe VM5. And I'm going to restart the machine. So when, when this machine gets restarted and comes back up, we automatically re-register the name change in the DNS service. So even if you log into a VM and change the name, we make sure we know about it, and we actually uh, re-register those entries in the Azure-provided DNS service. And it automatically reflects in the portal. So when the virtual machine gets restarted, uh, you should be able to see the new name displayed in the portal as well. So we keep track of the names. So with that, I'd like to actually welcome uh, Philip from Exit Games, who's here to talk about uh, an exciting game platform that he's put together. OK. Hi, um, my name is uh, Philip Rangel, and I'm architect at um, Exit Games. <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, we have a, a product. Photon, it's called Photon, and it's a socket server that it's being used by our developers to yeah, basically do the whole networking. Um, we support uh, UDP, um, reliable UDP, which is quite important for many of our developers, uh, TCP and web sockets. And uh, we have been nagging uh, the people at the Microsoft <laughs> to support a couple of features we need to bring uh, our product uh, to Azure. And uh, yes, uh, we, are, we are now there. And uh, we're about to release a, a preview um, so that you can um, test these things uh, quite easily uh, on Azure. Um, <clears throat> um, one of the main things um, is that we, have, um, that we support um, uh, a lot of platforms, client platforms. We support iPhone, uh, Android, um, Flash, um, actually everything you, you can, can imagine. Um, next, I will show you um, um, a demo. And before that, I'm going to explain um, our architecture. And there are two things we are using in, in Azure that are very important for, for us. So um, first, I'm going to explain how the service actually works. So when a client connects, it connects to, to a, um, a master server, what we, what we call a master service, um, where a matchmaking uh, takes place. Um, um, when the client connects there, he looks, either he creates a game or joins um, a game, and he gets in in return he gets um, the the IP and the port he's supposed to to connect to, to connect to this um, game. Um, so the, the the main idea behind this is that when you look to a game uh, you look for a game 
uh, you bring um, clients together connected on one of on one specific node so that we have a very very low latency um, the other reason is that it's much easier for developers just to um, develop in, in in this in this manner because uh, um, they are not really used to um, to do um, um, deployment um, they are not very used to to do um, development um, well um, <laughs> sorry um, they are not used to to to, to develop um, games where where um, where the state is um, it's on different on different nodes uh, because it it simply and the, the latency is terrible, uh, and, and so that's something the game developers never do. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we use to, 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 to achieve this architecture is um, we use custom probes to, to define which of the um, master roles is going to be, or master instances, is going to be used uh, when a client connects to it. And um, in the in in the um, in the backend, we we um, do a leader election between both of these um, instances, and um, <coughs> the the leader answers with okay, and the the non-leader answers with non not okay. So when um, when the client connects, it it gets routed to, to only one of them. Um, yeah, basically that's that's the the, the, the architecture we are using, and um, I'm going to show you um, a demo. This is basically already connected, but I'm showing you. So what Philip is actually showing you is the gaming platform where he's actually deployed the service in our US East data center. So when we connect first, as you can see in the screen, you're connecting to that cloud app on port 5000, which is the master service. And he's got two instances that are actually, uh, one of it is the master at any given point in time, and he does leader election. And once you connect to a particular room that he's going to do when he hits start here, uh, the gaming server tells the client to go to a particular game room, and you'd see that there's already a game room that's been set up, and when he joins it, it's going to direct him to go to a particular room and a particular port. So when so currently I'm connected to port 5000, which is uh, uh, currently the, the, the port that it's used to uh, select the master, and um, now I'm joining the room we created, and you will see up here that we are connected to um, to the same IP with uh, 7000 with the port 7001 and with UDP, and then we have a round trip time of about 100 110, which is really great considering that we are connecting to to the US. So here you can see that Ganesh is. Right next to me, and we also have uh, our CEO here, and he's connected with Chris over there. So, so as you can see, it really feels very well, and you have a very great, uh, a very good latency, and a very uh, good uh, gaming experience. So overall, the fact is the fact. It he's able to give you this good gaming experience because all players in the same room are directed to pretty much the same server, so maintaining state and doing everything is extremely easy for him to co-locate everything. And he's able to do that only because we expose the ability for him to direct traffic to a particular instance behind the load balancer. So just that you can see, um, we deployed this photon US. You have this IP. 
and this is the IP we are using over here. One sixty eight sixty two thirty seven one seven four. So next, um, if we have some time, sure. <laughs> I prepared a little demo just to show you how we are using basically the uh, custom probes. And um, actually, we are using um, one of the features that is not so easy to implement is actually the leader election, uh, which in um, VM in the IIS, um, <clears throat> it's done by, by, by Microsoft for you. And we are just, um, for, in past, you have to take care of this uh, yourself. And what we're just um, using at the moment, or we are moving into, is to use um, a feature that um, Blob Storage is giving to you, uh, which is um, using leases. And what we do is we create, um, we create a Blob Storage where one of the, or the first uh, instance that connects um, gets the lease um, of this, Point in the in the in, in the blob storage, and um, writes writes its name into into this blob, so that everybody else also knows who who is the master at that point. And I'm going to show you how this uh, how this works. I hope uh, I hope the demo I get, I show you works works out. Um, so I set up a little service, which is a bit simpler. It only has two instances. Um, and two instances, and we and I set up actually our our standard ports, uh, the fifty fifty five we use for UDP, uh, the ninety ninety we use for web sockets, and um, the ninety forty three and eighty uh, eight forty three are used for um, what they call policy requests, which is something you need for uh, Silverlight, for instance. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm doing now is I have just connected to, to one of these um, instances, um, which is the, using the UDP protocol 5055. So we can look I'm currently connected to this um, to this instance, which um, has a name with four hundred and six at the end. And then what I'm going to do is to restart the service or to just stop our application. And now we have to wait a little. So while he's waiting for it, so what he's actually trying to do is the fact that he's waiting for the lease to be released and for the other instance to grab the lease. And when the other instance grabs the lease, it becomes the master. So uh, at that point in time, it starts responding to the probes, and the leader gets switched. This is this is the kind of logic that we actually use for you know figuring out active passive in a whole bunch of services that we implement. So when I talk about virtual network gateways tomorrow, no, we, we have a virtual network and a gateway, and our gateway actually uses this, this similar logic to actually do active passive failover to actually maintain a tunnel uh, between your premises and the cloud. And this is a very similar logic that we also use to enable uh, Windows Azure based, you know, clustering in Windows Azure. So when we start enabling high availability support, the logic that we use under the covers is very similar to this logic that uh, Philip is explaining. Yep. No, the game continues to keep uh, working. Yes, just the the traffic gets diverted to another instance. The master server gets switched to another instance. Actually, now you, we just saw that the leader changed to to this other machine. And what I'm hoping to see now
is now I don't have any connections to this. And my service is there again. And when I go back, I see that it just connected to the machine where the master just switched to. Well, that's what I'm working on at the moment, or we are working on at the moment. Uh, it depends a little bit on how often you, you, you call and what timeout you set uh, in the lease. At the moment, I, just, I think I, I have the standard, which is 90, 90 seconds. Yeah, I think 90 seconds. That's why it took a little bit. There are two logics here. One is the fact that it's the blob lease logic yes. that he's using to figure out who gr grabs the lease. And the second is the probing interval and the probing timeout. So you have to have both happen for your failover to actually happen if you're using uh, the blob leases to figure out who's active and to respond to the probes. So typically, it's two probes plus a little bit of time for it to fail over. And you get to control, in the case of pass, you get to control how often we probe you. So you could set it to something as aggressive as five seconds and have it fail over in 10 seconds. Or you could set it up to like a minute or two minutes if you don't want it to be really aggressive. And the failover happens based on that. So currently, um, I set up the, the, the probing quite aggressively to five seconds and uh, a timeout of 11 seconds. Which um, the idea behind is that actually what, <laughs> what was missing at the moment, and it makes it quite fast, is um, I can show you how fast it could get if I start this um, again with. I'm trying to see if I can. Actually, this what I'm showing you here has the same logic the 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 server on the instances has too. So actually, he could have grabbed the the uh, mastership, and uh, it it worked well because it didn't. I would have had to stop it. But let me show you. I can do the same again. Let me see where it is. I have to stop the other machines, actually. Yeah? OK. So thank you, Philip. Uh, <laughs> great demo. So uh, uh, let's. Well, thank you for your patience, and <laughs> I hope you liked it. So if you have any questions about how Philip managed to do it, um, I placed the contact information for Philip in the slide deck, and you can feel free to reach out to Philip if you had any more questions around how he uh, used all the features that we put together. Now, I wanted to move on to talking about something new, so something that we've had in Azure for a while now that's been in preview for some time, which is the Windows Azure Traffic Manager. So if you're deploying a service in a particular region and you really want it to be available across all regions, so we actually have this DNS policy-based load balancing service that we run as well. So what it essentially does is it dis distributes traffic to the best or the closest data center uh, that you're actually hosted in. And uh, it ensures that you can you know, have high availability even if one service is down in one particular region. We point you to another region for failover purposes or for performance purposes. So let's say you're running a global service and you wanted to run it in Asia, Europe, and North America. You could actually deploy services in all these three regions and actually do geoload balancing. So you could define a policy for performance where we, if any client from Europe is trying to connect to the same service, it gets directed to the service that's sitting in Europe, whereas a client from North America gets connected to the service in North America. So it's, it's primarily based on metrics that we build based on DNS latencies and resolution times. So we have three, load, three schemes that we support. One is for performance, which means we direct you to the closest uh, service to you geographically. Round robin, where we distribute traffic across all services, and failover. So in case you, you, you by default land to the closest one, and if that fails, we direct you to another service somewhere else so that you still have connectivity to that service, and that service is always up and running. So now let me actually show you how easy it is to set up um, and load, you know, this traffic manager and use it for geo-load balancing. 
So this is unfortunately still one of those features that's stuck in the old Windows Azure portal. And uh, we are trying to work it, uh, you know, move this into the new Windows Azure portal pretty soon. For the sake of this demo, what I've done is I've actually deployed the same service in three different regions. Um, if you look at my cloud services, you see Watom Demo Southeast Asia, Watom Demo West Europe, and Watom Demo uh, West US. Each of them have a different WIP and a different URL to go to. So in this case, the one in US is 168 ending with 186. And I have put different pictures just to show you which service that we are landing in. If we are in Europe, it's going to be 168 ending with 92. And the service in Asia is going to be a 111 dot IP address. So all of them have different pictures as you can see. Now I'm going to create a load balancing policy here, a traffic manager policy for performance. So it points you to the closest service and takes you to the closest service. So it's extremely easy to do that using the portal. All you have to do is create a new load balancing policy and add the services that you want to be load balanced. So in this particular case, I want to have the one in Southeast Asia, the one in Europe, and the one in US. I want to, I actually have to periodically probe on, a, probe on it to know what the metrics are. So I probe on it on port 80, and I want to connect it using this URL, Watom demo, and I want to probe on it every 30 seconds to know what's actually happening. So by just configuring this, I've actually created a, a traffic manager policy for performance, which means it's going to take me to the closest uh, service here if I was to access this through the web. So let's say I went to this website and I said bottomdemo.trafficmanager.net. It would take me to the service that I connected to, which is in Europe. So just to, you know, just seeing it doesn't help you much. So what I'm going to do is actually give the URL to a DNS service. What this just DNS lookup service does is it's going to give you the IP address that you get returned when you look up this URL in a whole bunch of DNS servers across multiple regions. So when I do this lookup, it's actually looking up a whole bunch of DNS servers that's distributed all over the world. As you can see, there are DNS servers in Singapore, Amsterdam, Florida, Sydney, and so on. And the IP address that it returns when you do the same lookup is different. And if you look at it, the one in Singapore takes you to the service that's uh, deployed in uh, Southeast Asia. The one in Amsterdam returns the one that's in Europe. And the one in, let's say if we have one in USA, the Santa Clara one takes you to the West US data center. So for the same service that I've deployed in different region, for the same URL, I get different IPs and I get directed to different data centers. So if you want high availability for a service that's geo-distributed, you can actually deploy the same service in different regions and define a load balancer policy in Traffic Manager. And we make sure that based on DNS metrics, we actually distribute the traffic to the right service in the right region. And that brings me to the next thing, which is the most important and interesting feature set for us from a networking perspective that we released as part of the launch two weeks back. Now, um, Azure is one of the platforms uh, for you to consider when you do hybrid scenarios. Uh, we have a bunch of sessions, one session by our distinguished engineer, Yusuf Khalidi, tomorrow, where he'll talk about all the hybrid options that we have in Windows Azure. You could do a whole bunch of options that I've listed here. And we've introduced one new feature, which is uh, enabling the ability to set up virtual networks in Windows Azure and treating it as just another branch office in uh, Windows Azure and connecting it to your premises using a site-to-site -site VPN solution. So uh, it's a very cool technology where uh, we've enabled the ability to create a virtual network in Azure. So it has stable IP addresses. You get to bring your own IP address space, car route, subnets from your corporate uh, address space or your enterprise address space use it to assign IP addresses for virtual machines that you deploy in the cloud and connect it to your premises using a site-to-site -site VPN solution. It also enables you to essentially use your own DNS servers so that you can actually domain join virtual machines that are running in Azure to your corporate domain controllers or set up domain controllers in Windows Azure 
and domain join virtual machines. And it enables you to run SharePoint farms in Windows Azure. And it, it, it's essentially the underlying networking infrastructure that's required to support complex scenarios like running SharePoint and Windows Azure. And I'm going to be spending a lot of time tomorrow talking about how to create virtual networks, what are all the benefits, how it works, and how it doesn't, and so on. Now, we've had another service that's been out in preview for about a year now. It's called uh, Windows Azure Connect. Just a show of hands, how many of you have used Windows Azure Connect in the past? So Windows, great. So Windows Azure Connect is actually a machine-to-machine -machine connectivity solution that's based on an IP overlay IPv6 relay network. And it's, it's great for dev test kind of scenarios, but it's not really suitable for uh, enterprise class workloads like uh, what you want to run where you want to use a domain controller. Because if you wanted to actually run a domain controller, you really don't want to deploy an agent in it that Sydney requires. And that's what made us to come up with uh, Windows Azure Virtual Networks. So I'm going to be talking about that in detail tomorrow and talk about the differences and what each of these uh, offers. So let me just recap all the features that we have uh, introduced as part of our spring release. So we originally had only HTTP and TCP support for connectivity through the internet. Now we've added support for UDP. We support load balancing virtual machines which are modeled as single instance roles in Windows Azure. So you can do high availability for services that are purely IaaS based. We support custom probes that enable you to essentially load balance based on the health of an application or based on the health of a virtual machine. We support communication between various virtual machines over any IP-based protocol, including UDP. We support name resolution using Azure provided uh, name resolution as a service, so you don't have to bring in your own DNS servers for name resolution when you're setting up simple multi-tier applications in Windows Azure. We have Traffic Manager as a service that helps you do geo load balancing. And we're going to introduce, we've introduced Windows Azure Virtual Network that enables you to connect your premises to the cloud using a site-to-site -site VPN connection, as well as have a virtual private network that runs in the cloud. So overall, I think we've made sufficient enhancements in the platforms to enable you to run uh, serious workloads in Windows Azure. And this truly complements all the investments we've made to virtual machines. So with that, you know, if you wanted to try out all these features, you know, you can go to the Windows Azure portal. It, you can sign up for a free 90-day subscription, download the latest version of the SDK from the portal, and try out all our new features. I've created an email alias that you can email if you have any feedback on any of the features that uh, we talked about, and also if you had any questions or suggestions for features that you'd like to see. If you have issues with any, with any of the features, we also have forums that we've set up where you can go and post about your, your questions, and we'll make sure we answer your questions in the forums. So with that, I'd like to take any questions you have around networking in general in Azure. So it's like, you know, the advantage of using pass is the fact that if your load becomes too much, you can always scale the number of instances, add more instances to it, and uh, your application scales as the load increases. So that's the advantage that pass gives you. So based on how much each server can handle, I'd let Philip answer that, but it, it's based on the logic that they've, they have in place.
so when we add another one, uh, what happens is that we actually use a feature of the direct ports. We only have to add more instances, so they, 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 they automatically get ready. So the ports, this fixed port ranges, get increased with the new uh, instances that are created. So if you create, uh, let's say you have instance one to five, and you create three more, uh, they will be uh, they will be added, and the ports will be available then too. So, so there is there no strict relation between the players in a certain room and their frequency. It is actually when one when 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 a game is set up, and the players will be connected on one instance, and they will be all on this instance. Yeah. Yes. So you can the, have exclusive. So when the machine is full, the, the room is full. Oh, that's what you mean. Yeah. Um, you yep. After so yeah, we can we can have a, a, an extra session for this. Yeah. So any more questions for me or Philip? You can actually join me here. <laughs> so uh, there are a whole bunch of related sessions that we have on Windows Azure uh, that talk about all the investments we've made for virtual machines, in terms of the enhancements we've made in the platform as a whole to support other kinds of tools. And also stuff that we've done around we're, we've done around enabling hybrid scenarios in Windows Azure. Um, Corey Sanders already talked about virtual machines and what it has to offer in Windows Azure. We have a few sessions that talk about how you can use a whole bunch of tools to do advanced scenarios using virtual machines. There's going to be one by Vijay Rajagopalan, and one by Michael Washam and Corey Sanders again. And we're going to have one by uh, Yusuf Khalidi that talks about what are all the options we have in Windows Azure to support hybrid scenarios. And I have a session tomorrow evening where I talk about virtual networks in particular, what we've done to enable uh, the ability to create virtual networks in Azure and how you can connect virtual networks in Azure to your premises and how that enables a whole bunch of scenarios like monitoring, debugging, identity using Active Directory, and typically treating whatever you deploy in Azure as though you have a deployment in a branch office and manage them seamlessly. So if you're interested in that topic, you could attend that session as well. So. Thank you very much.